So just in the interest of time, um, I thought I'd do a really quick hello introductions uh, opening to why we're here tonight. Um, so first, this is our last of uh, this semester's TR Talks. We're trying to have conversations about translation, about moving knowledge and research forward into implementation. Um, and our speakers tonight are amazing people in and of themselves, but they're also amazing people that you don't see here that contributed to this night. Um, our various departments that are part of the Translational Re Research Hub um, that may be soon rebranded to my TO um, because apparently a Translational Hub is not uh, the best marketing um, strategy. And as researchers, sometimes we forget that names matter. Um, also, the, to the Translational Research Program and students and everyone that participated, um, and the Health Innovation Hub um, is uh, also a sponsor. And this was also sponsored by the Cannot Global Fund uh, from the Vice President Research and Innovation. Um, the format, uh, for those of you that have been here, is pretty casual. Our moderator will introduce uh, the format, <laughs> and um, feel free to jump in. There's a mic here. This is meant to be a, a, an open conversation on translating clinical insights. And what that means, we will soon find out. Mohammed? Great, thank you. Um, people can hear me? All right, fantastic. Welcome, everyone. I've been asked to moderate this panel and uh, keep our rowdy panelists in check. So that is my job. Uh, my name is Mohamed Mamdani. I am the Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Unity Health Toronto, which is St. Michael's, uh, St. Joseph's, and Providence Healthcare in, uh, here in Toronto. Um, and I'm told that you're a pretty rowdy crowd as well, and that you're not just here for the sandwiches. That's correct, right? All right, so we have um, a pretty interesting session lined up tonight. The topic really is around how do you get clinical insights into practice? And you know, a lot of the scientists types will do the discovery part, right? And we'll discover a molecule or we'll discover some, some sort of technology or device. But to get it into the hands of lots and lots of people to benefit the patients that a lot of us serve, that's a whole other story and ballgame uh, and can be quite complicated. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and spend about five minutes, five to seven, let's say, to walk people through, and Christine's getting nervous, yes. um, to, walk, <laughs> to walk people through their journey in terms of being that scientist who discovers to getting things translated, or at least thinking about these sorts of issues, spending a bit of time on their path and especially their successes and more, perhaps more importantly, their challenges. Um, then what I'd like to do is open it up to the crowd for questions. And if there aren't any, I will ask questions. That's your hint to say, please think of some questions, because you don't want me asking them. All right? Any questions? It's not a trick. All right, why don't we begin? Why don't we start with Christine? Okay. So my name's Christine Allen. I've been at the University of Toronto for almost 18 years. Um, but I started when I was very young, so I'm still quite young. Um, uh, so my, my area of research, I did my PhD in chemistry and then I did a postdoc at the BC Cancer Agency and I spent some time in industry. Um, and it was a startup company that I was in called Celator Technologies. And we were very much focused on drug combinations. So taking drug combinations and putting them into a single carrier, finding a synergistic ratio, putting them into a single carrier and then delivering them to the tumor. Um, and interestingly, one of my very close friends and one of the founders of this company came to visit my lab today, so he spent a lot of time with my lab. Um, and they actually had a drug that was approved just two years ago, and the company was then acquired by Jazz Pharmaceuticals for $1.5 billion. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have left. Um, but I did leave, uh, but it gave me a window into startup companies and the fact that I liked being part of a startup company. What I found hard at the time was that I was quite young, living in Vancouver. The rest of my family was on the East Coast. 
Um, and we were really month to month. I, it was just a few of us. I'd started a polymer division within the company as a polymer chemist. I got a big IRAP grant that helped us start that. I was really excited to be there. But I found, um, I learned something about myself. I wasn't great with risk. Um, you know, I'm a bit conservative when it comes to risk. And I was very uncomfortable with the fact that we were month to month. And I didn't know if I was going to have a job, in other words, the next month. And I really had nobody else there to help me or support me. So I started to think, you know, whether or not I wanted to stay into industry. I started to apply for jobs in large pharmaceutical companies as well as academia. And I got the job at University of Toronto. Because I had that experience, though, and, and genuinely enjoyed it, um, and remained a, you know, a consultant for that company even to this day, um, I've always been very much engaged in industry. So I have, I've had an academic lab, but we always have two to three or four even industry contracts or sponsored research agreements running through my lab. As well in my lab, um, we're very much, some of the technology has been licensed to companies. I'm also a founder of a company. So I've been very much involved in spearheading startup companies, supporting startup companies, driving innovation. Um, in terms of failures, I've had many failures, spectacular failures. I had one technology that I worked on for about 10 years. Um, it was an ovarian technology. There was someone that we knew that had passed away from ovarian cancer, and that's usually how I become interested in a disease or working in an area as I know someone um, that has the disease. I'm not a clinician, um, so that's kind of my experience and that I want to work in that area. So we'd known someone that was close to us that passed away from ovarian cancer. I became interested in the area. And we started working in the lab on this technology that would deliver drugs specifically to the peritoneal cavity. And when you are a cancer patient and you have ovarian cancer, they would usually inject it intravenously, and the chemotherapy will go everywhere. So the idea was to really concentrate it in the peritoneal ca cavity. But it was an implant. Okay? So we worked on this. We had patents. The patents were issued. Very exciting, wonderful preclinical animal data. We go to the clinicians. The clinicians say, we don't want to do surgery to implant something. We want to inject something. So we had to re-engineer everything so that it was an injectable gel, which we did. We got the patent again. We go through the whole process. The technology ended up being licensed. And I would say in our case, we licensed it to the wrong group. Um, I worked with that group very closely. And you know we were full of hope um, that this was going to go somewhere and would finally reach a patient. It never did. Um, so I don't know if it was timing or what, but from my perspective looking back now, I think we just licensed it to the wrong group. So it's just an example. The way that I look at things now is I think there are many, many ideas out there, and I've had great ideas, many people have great ideas. I actually think the implementation is the hardest part. Um, and I know that's difficult maybe as a scientist to hear, because I'm a scientist, it's difficult for me to hear that. Um, but I think it's really critical. The people that you choose to partner with in clinical translation, in business development, in marketing, in et cetera, very, very key components. So now, you know, through the years, I've been involved in some administrative roles. In July of this year, I had the opportunity to take on a new role, Associate Vice President and Vice Provost Strategic Initiatives at the University of Toronto. This is a new portfolio that the University of Toronto has started, and it's all about increasing our ability to support and make sustainable large interdisciplinary, interdivisional strategic research initiatives. So to really bring different groups of people together and to address complex issues, grand challenges. So I've been doing that for the last four months. I still run my research group. Um, and it's been an amazing experience, very fulfilling. Um, I, I think I had a very small view of what was going on at the institution because I was very much involved in my faculty and some of the collaborators that I work with re immediately around it. And I've just been completely humbled by the breadth and depth of research excellence at the University of Toronto. So I really consider this a golden opportunity. And it's not very different. What I'm doing right now is not very different from running a startup. I have a very small, nimble team. Um, we decide that we, you know, the government's interested in a certain area. And so we pivot quickly to, to bring a team together and to start to work in that area and to put a proposal forward and to see if we can secure funds. Maybe it's a philanthropic donor instead. So it's not that different um, from running a startup company. Oh, you bet you are. <laughs> Touché. <Yeah. laughs> no, we have to be nice. Yeah. No funny. Good evening. Uh, my name is Norm Rosenblum. I'm a pediatric nephrologist and senior scientist and professor at the University of Toronto, I'm based at SickKids Hospital where I do my clinical work. I have a 
research lab there. I've had this job at SickKids and the university for 26 years, uh, and I'm 38. So, uh, <laughs> years. Um, uh, I'm also uh, presently the scientific director of the uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, Institute for Nutrition, Metabolism, and Diabetes, bracket kidney disease, and bracket. Um, uh, I really started out as being uh, enthralled with medicine. I still am. Uh, I love kids. I love working with families. Uh, Pediatric diseases are the most interesting diseases on the planet. They teach us about human development, and children are our future. And so I was uh, easily compelled to work with children. The kidney is the most interesting of all organs, the most important, uh, the most misunderstood. Uh, not at all. As you can see, I'm a dispassionate observer of medicine and my career. Uh, I've spent 26 years running a lab um, which is focused on the mechanisms of kidney, how the kidney develops and how it becomes malformed. Uh, even though these are not high incidence problems in the general population, uh, they are the major cause of kidney failure in children. And if you've ever looked after a child with kidney failure, then you will understand why I'm compelled to try to deal with that because we have no, none, zero specific interventions to deal with malformation of the kidney. None. But we have great supportive care. We have great dialysis. We have great transplants. And that's all good. But these are treatments. They're not solu end solutions. Uh, this is a problem that has obsessed me since uh, I walked through the period of the revolution in science. I'm old enough to have been witness to the first knockout mice. 30 years. First ones. <laughs> I went to dinner at a conference when I was a postdoc because my tra trajectory was I did go to medical school, not veterinarian school. I uh, then was a resident in pediatrics, a chief resident, then a fellow in pediatric nephrology. Then I became a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, where I trained clinically and went into a, a laboratory. I studied extracellular matrix biology for various reasons. I went to a conference, and the dinner speaker, a, uh, who came out in a crumpled up sweater, khaki pants, and sneakers, was a Nobel laureate um, named Oliver Smithies. Well, he wasn't yet a Nobel laureate, but he was going to be very soon afterwards and who was one of uh, the first, along with Mario Capecchi, to figure out how to switch genes in stem cells. And I realized, uh, even I realized, that the world of what I was interested in would never be the same. It was like the clouds had cleared, and this silly embryology that we used to do of taking a guinea pig nose and sticking it with a horse's foot and seeing what happened, those days were over because we were going to do things in transgenic mice and they were already doing it. I jumped into this field. I then experienced the Human Genome Project, uh, which uh, you know, the first genome was sequenced for uh, I don't know how many billion. Uh, now can be done for about $10,000, uh, even Canadian. Uh, these changes revolutionized everything we thought about and how we think about it and what we could do. And so I run a lab of transgenic mice and making models in mice for human disease, which I've done in at least two different diseases, uh, types of malformation, and tried to find translational solutions for those. So from a scientific perspective, I've been reasonably successful. I had a ha I've had a hell of a good time, um, that's for sure, uh, at the expense of the Canadian public because I've been funded all the time by the Canadian public, so thank you very much for all that money. Uh, and, and to the mice, of which there are thousands, I thank you. Uh, and I thank your kidneys. They've been wonderful. Um, but the problem has been two things. Translation is really hard. 
We discovered a mechanism by which a uh, pacemaker function works in ureters. These are the tubes that go from your kidney to your bladder. And if you don't have that, your urine stays high and doesn't go down to your bladder. So that's a problem, actually. You know, you wouldn't like that, believe me. Um, we discovered a mechanism that makes those pacemaker cells develop and work. That was thought to be, though, well, that's an interesting thing. We also discovered a mechanism for a, the major cause of kidney obstruction that's congenital. But converting those things to translational solutions that would have a market bite is a totally different matter. So the currency was great. You know, journal clinical investigation, best journals in nephrology, terrific. All good. Wallets full of good credits. After that, nothing. So this teaches you something. I have a second passion. Uh, I think I have at least 20 seconds left. Second passion is the training of clinician scientists. I've been very involved in this for a long time. Uh, I was associate, the only, the first and only associate dean for physician scientist training in the faculty of medicine, where I ran the MD PhD program, the postgraduate clinical investigator program, and a bunch of other things that we got involved in. I created the Canadian Child Health Clinician Scientist Program, which is still ongoing, a very successful uh, clinician scientist training program in pediatrics. Uh, across all child health professions, not just physicians, a subject I feel very strongly about. And through that, I began firsthand to experience in it with, through a different lens, the ecosystem of science, the way it works mm -hmm. or doesn't, because I saw through the lens of people's careers, mm -hmm. not just my own. I was sort of marching happily along. I learned how to game the system. I learned how to be successful. I learned how to publish the papers, get promoted. But the big game is not about that. The big game is helping people. And, and ROI, return on investment, as seen through a policymaker, through a cabinet minister. It's a different problem. And so I began to see things very much through that in an international perspective. And I, with others, started a program called the Eureka Institute for Translational Medicine in 2008, which is focused on the education of translational scientists and trying to disrupt a system that we think is not really a system that doesn't work very well. So I'm very interested in you guys because you're the next translational somebodies in the pathway of translational medicine, whether you're the scientists, the business, the, the IP guys, the, the whoever, the patient advocates, you're all part of a system that is very complex and not well taught and not well professionalized actually in my view. So these are the two things that sort of keep me going every day. And at the CIHR, we try to create opportunities strategically for investments in these areas, which is probably of lesser importance because I'm being told the trap door is opening. So thank you very much. Okay, I play the cello. What else? I'm married for, four, for 40 years. Okay, very happily. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, the applause should go to my wife. Yeah, and I have three grandchildren. What else were you thinking? But your other two roles that are relevant to this discussion are? Are, what do you do with Uri? Ah, with Uri. So Uri and I have conversations every now and then, which I delight in because he's a marvelous translational researcher in the field of pediatric oncology. And he is the head of this hub what we call the translational, Toronto Translational Eureka Hub. And I'm sort of backdoor guy that tries to help him out, so I'm happy to do that. And I don't know what else you're thinking. But and do you sit on a certain board? Well, I sit on the board of directors of Eureka, which I have. <laughs> this is a game now. Yes. <laughs> it's a game for five points. <laughs> now, what is the other board? Now, why don't you tell us? Friday. Friday. Yes, I'm on the advisory board for the TRP. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. I'm on a lot of committees. I'm on a lot of committees, and it's it's the best advisory board. It's so much fun. Oh my God, we had a lot of fun. And, the, and by the way, you're the head of that program. We had a lot of fun giving you a hard time. That was great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, good evening. I'm uh, Etienne Sibyl. I am uh, I'm a senior scientist. I'm at CAMH, you know, the Center for Addiction Mental Health. I'm also a professor in psychiatry, 
at UFT, also a professor in pharmacology. Um, by training, I'm a molecular neurobiologist. So I, I grew up in France. I spent 25 years in the US. I was at uh, Columbia University. Then the last 10 years, I was a tenured faculty at the University of Pittsburgh, Department of Psychiatry. And I was recruited here over five years ago now at CAMH. And uh, having had a great time, having a great time here has been. Uh, and um, so I have different roles uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I have a larger research group where we look at molecular, cellular basis of depression, aging, um, and uh, everything we develop. Uh, I figure a test on myself, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm 85 years old, and uh, so you tell me if it works. <laughs> so, it works. It's good. Uh, yeah, so, um, but, um, so, why, why I'm here, I think, is, um, you know, the, the difficulty we've been facing, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm come from the, you know, the, the psychiatry department that's part of the translational hub, so I'm, I'm uh, involved in the translational hub of Toronto as well, and um, in, in psychiatry, you know, we, in terms of reversing a translation, we've been stuck with this problem that, uh, you know, the diagnostic and criteria have nothing to do with science. You know, they're just a bunch of symptoms that you put together and they make sense and they have a good use for clinical, for the, for the healthcare system, for reimbursement, but in terms of research, they're completely useless because they're not anchored in biology. So, uh, and coming, you know, in terms of my clinical insight, I've always come actually from patients once they passed away. You know, we've done a lot of molecular work in the human <coughs> postmortem brain, and, uh, and what we've discovered is, you know, we, I mean us and many others, you know, is that those clinical diagnostic really at the molecular level don't make any sense either. You know, the same, I was going to say, the field is going toward what you would say, for example, in cardiovascular research where you have different major syndromes, but underlying, you can have high blood cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, these are distributed across those diseases, but you actually target, they're actually the real target, they're not the syndrome, you don't target the heart attack, you target the underlying factor. And I think in psychiatry, we're discovering this the same, there are vulnerability in the brain, and uh, in terms of failure, you know, we've, we've had, we've uncovered over the years many of those shared pathologies, you know, between depression, bipolar, schizophrenia. All the way, you know, psychiatry is meeting, you know, after 100 years or 150 when, you know, early century, 19th century, when psychiatry and, and neurology were separated because one you could see, the other you couldn't, uh, you know, during Freud's time, you know, now it's merging again where at the molecular level, you know, for example, some of the finding we have in, in, in some of the pathways, you know, we've identified have to do with inhibition in the brain and they go from depression all the way to Alzheimer. So we, you know, we, and I mean, as the field, we're redefining what psychiatry is, a little bit like what cancer has done in the past 40 years, you know, from disease of organ to pathways, and that's what you go first. And uh, so the translation for us, uh, you know, just, um, instead of talking about the difficulty, I would say how the field is addressing those difficulties, so I'm very tuned into NIH because I spend a lot of time in the U.S., and, and, uh, you know, for example, there's a large initiative in redefining models. What do you mean by a model, and, and why is that important? And it's hugely important in terms of translation, because if you do a model of depression, so-called, you know, well, first you're starting with something that doesn't really exist as a biology, and then you model, so already you have two degrees of falsehood, and then you want to translate that back to the clinic. So rather than that, you know, now you're redefining the model, model of pathways, model of pathologies, and let's see what it corresponds to. So, so why I'm here also, you know, over the years we've discovered some, uh, some of those pathways, developed molecules, we've just started a company with new molecules that treat cognitive symptoms, so cognitive deficit across disorders, all the way from depression to, to Alzheimer's. And that's one example of, uh, you know, what we're trying to translate according to this kind of new uh, perspective on brain disease. And, uh, and I think that that is starting to address some of the difficulty because talking about difficulty, psychiatry is probably the worst. You know the, the, you know the rate failure in Alzheimer? I think it's like 99.5. I mean, I don't think it can get worse than that. 
and, and in depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, we've used the same drug that were basically discovered by chance over 60 years ago. They all need two drugs. So now, you know, the farmers are starting to panic because, you know, the patent ran out, they, they, they can only make so many similar molecules, and they've gone, they exited the field, so they talking about difficulty. So there's a whole activity at the level of biotech now that has really taken over. And it um, doesn't mean that translation is harder, but actually there's a lot of activity in small to medium size uh, biotech. Uh, and, and I think the farmers are letting the innovation come from those companies and then, you know, taking over. There's a little hope in that couple of drugs were approved by the FDA last year or this year in terms of one was ketamine in terms of you know, fast-acting antidepressant, reducing suicidality. The other was allopregnanone, GABA, positive allosteric modulator in uh, postpartum depression. So, you know, glutamatergic, GABA, different from monoaminate. So th there's starting to be glimpse of hopes of this overall approach that I described, you know, redefining disease based from the bottom up, I would say. So I'm very hopeful, and uh, which I think is a trait you have to have in this business, otherwise you're out very early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's uh, his definition of it, yeah. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and I'm very glad to be part of this. Uh, so I'm, I'm involved, uh, I guess, in the, the board of the Eureka Hub as well, and uh, it's an exciting time. So. Fantastic, thank you. So we have an excellent panel. We have a mental health expert with a high failure rate in certain conditions. <laughs> we have a 38-year-old nephrologist who's been married for 40 years. And we have a polymer chemist who's terrified of kittens. I just made the last part up. Um, we have a lot of expertise in this panel, um, a lot of successes and a, and a lot of failures as well, which I think everybody needs to learn from. So if I were you, I would take advantage of this opportunity and ask as many questions as possible. So are there any questions from the audience? So within the university system and the research system more broadly, what kind of incentive systems would allow a scientist to not just focus on the discovery part, but also the deployment part and be incentivized to do it? I, I'll give you an example. Uh, incentivize. One simple way is a pattern. So my wife is a scientist. She worked uh, in the industry for a long time. She had probably like 40 patents in chemistry. Company would give her a plaque and one dollar per patent. So that was her incentive to stay. And we always say university is really bad. Well, you know, actually most of university, it varies from hospital to hospital. But actually you write a patent, you know, in that clause, you get actually probably between 20, 40, 50% of the rights of that patent. So you incentivize, incentivize. You get incentive, you get something back. Um, so I think th this is important, you know, and, and it goes down to what are the criteria? Yes, papers, grants, but, you know, it should be a little more incentive uh, uh, on, on the, you know, uh, looking at patent, look, looking at development, looking at innovation, looking at that. I think it should be as important in terms of, uh, you know, promotion, etc. But in terms of incentive, they're potentially a huge one as well, you know. The, so I think that I'll stop there and you know, give another yeah. people the opportunity. So I'll just focus uh, on the publication equation for, uh, for a second because I think that's where you started. There are some places, uh, I don't think the University of Toronto is one of them actually right now, uh, or it has been, nor has it been for quite some time. But there are places I go where uh, investigators are told if your publication is not in a a journal with an impact factor of 15 or greater, don't even count it on your CV. Okay, what that effectively means is that um, most of the faculty at the University of Toronto will not count most of their publications. Uh, now, sitting here is the past chair of the Promotions Committee at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine. I think that uh, Professor Gottlieb uh, will agree. 
that most of these publications will not be found on the CV. Now, the problem with this, uh, now, of course, this is becoming, this is the good news. Uh, many universities have begun to reject this uh, through uh, major consortia of thinking that have adopted principles. They were, uh, they're well known. These principles were uh, really articulated in what was called the Leiden Manifesto, which has to do with the lack of um, equivalence between what we call impact factor and impact and quality. The major problem in the translational field, quite apart from whether academics survive or not, which may be of interest or not actually to translational science. I mean, frankly, you know, who cares? Um, but the problem is, is that uh, if you read papers in Nature and other rather reputable journals, is that up to 80% of what is published cannot be replicated. And we've heard so about some of the reasons for this. One has to do with models that bear no relation or insufficient relation to human disease. That's a big one. Or the context of human disease. That things are uh, often investigated in a very clean environment, and the clean means many things here, or a simplistic environment. But what human beings face and when they take their drugs and they have three comorbidities, which are not accounted for in, comp in clinical trials because they can't be, it'd be way too expensive and everybody would fail, then that's a real problem because it'll never make it in the post-market environment, right? It'll just fail after it gets out there. So that's, so it, there's a real problem with, uh, with the equivalence of quality and impact with what has been considered impact factor. I would refer you to a major group of people called Science in Transition, which began in Europe um, at the University Medical Center Utrecht, which has spread quite widely and which I think is very seriously addressing this. Uh, the, uh, new guidelines called DORA guidelines adopted through the University of California system, which many people have signed on to, including journals. So for your benefit now, you want a university that doesn't, does, doesn't look at impact factor, is interested in what you write and, who, and what it means to whom and the quality of what you write. So it's assessed on that basis with all the wrinkles and, you know, because it's all subjective, let's face it. There's no objective thing. But I think you want that kind of hearing for your kind of work. You want a place that considers your patent work as equivalent and important to that. Your social accountability work in terms of why you work on that, what kind of groups you intersect with, your impact on trainees, those to be important factors in your promotion through the system. There are many universities that have gone this direction and are rejecting the, it's simple, if it's not 15 and greater, you're out of the game. Yes, but Norm, with all due respect, this yes. is well, I, yeah. Oh, it's Joseph, actually. <laughs> with, yeah. Thank you. Uh, with all due respect, that's about self-promotion and promotion. Um, and that's great, and I think these are sort of known things that impact, not impact yeah. factor, publication, let's look at alternative ways of promoting. Um, but what about the, I can't believe that those are the only problems in getting stuff outside of clinic into patients. Is it the academics are not being promoted and not publishing enough? Is that, it might understand that is the problem for translating clinical insights? Oh, okay. You're a good actor. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good actor, obviously. I never said any of those things, but uh, the fact is there's never been a time when scientists are more productive. The number of uh, science papers that are being published uh, is going up uh, almost at a logarithmic rate every year. So that's not our problem. That's not our problem. Also, discovery is not our problem in the sense that there's never been a period that is so lucrative, with, in my view, with respect to the discovery of knowledge. It's amazing. The issue is how to convert that. Actually, I think part of your question, though, the other piece that, I, that relates to this is individual excellence. And like getting into the programs that many of us have, have, got, have gotten into, 
um, getting promoted, getting my faculty position, getting promoted, getting tenure, whatever, was always based on individual excellence. So when I started at U of T, there were a number of faculty members that said to me, Christine, make sure you have you know, a series of publications where you are the only senior author. Now, I don't think somebody, I hope they wouldn't get that kind of advice now. They'd be a little bit more open to having other senior authors there. But I did have my, my NSERC research actually was my research where I was the only senior author. Um, and so I think there's this, what are the incentives? What's our incentive structure? And, and for me, a lot of the problem with getting things out there uh, translated to the clinic effectively is about collaboration and willingness to work with others, willingness to work in a team, willingness to, rec willingness to recognize that I can't do it all on my own, that I'm a scientist, I have a PhD, I don't have, you know, business development experience, I don't have marketing, I don't have, I don't have a lot of clinical insight, I'm not a clinical practitioner, so the, the failure that I talked to you about that was my spectacular failure was a rookie mistake. I went into the lab with my students, we designed a system, we never spoke to a clinician before we started to design it. We never really thought about the patients. So it's this, I think I can do this, I can do this on my own, and I couldn't. Um, so, you know, those failures actually have taught me through the years that I can't do it on my own. That, and, and I think now, like I'm starting to see, I know for myself, we have these performance evaluations every year that we need to fill out. And we've got these sections now on impact. And I think it's about impact. So not impact factor, but the impact of your work. And everyone will define impact differently. For some people, it may be translating your findings and getting it into a clinical trial. For others, it may not be, right? And that's okay. But it's thinking about impact. And for me, impact means I can't do it alone and I need to work as a team. That's great. Any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Sabrine. I'm a student at the Translational Research Program. Um, so I had a question regarding uh, funding uh, in relationship to, uh, <laughs> you're laughing, I know, <laughs> uh, in relationship to, um, I guess, translational research. So um, I think oftentimes, um, and this is again in, in, in my experience, uh, when we want to do uh, tra translational research projects uh, and we're applying for funding, sometimes it's confusing um, to explain like what our research methods are because we're starting from a place of ambiguity, right? We're starting from a place where we need to kind of identify what needs are and sometimes I think in like the basic research structure or the ways that people have generally come from is that they start from a place of understanding. So how do we mitigate that when we're, we're applying for, for funding and want to do these big projects and like, no offense, but CIHR rejects us. You know? <laughs> like, you know? So how, how do we do that? Well, the good news is that CIHR has very little to offer you with respect to what we would call true translational research. So you don't have to worry about applying to CIHR. <laughs> <laughs> The bad news is you've got to get your money from somewhere. And the problem is, is it's a little like the publication curve. I would refer you to a paper on the nature biotechnology, last author, Prakken, P-R-A-K-K-E-N, which looks at the impact factor of the, of the series of papers that are published along the translational pathway. What's really striking about this curve, it goes like this, by the way. It's a very simple graph. At the first hit, when you find a lead, you demonstrate a target, you find a lead for that target, you publish it, usually it's high profile because you've uncovered something quite new. And you, it's in a high impact paper. Then you have to go through all the various steps, you know, for example, validation, then you go into GMC, CMC, all these stuff, very costly stuff, hundreds, 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 thousands of dollars, um, the chemistry, you know, the development costs and so on. You finally get to clinical trial only when you've trial, you run a successful trial, all the way you're in pretty mediocre journals if you're publishing, all right, after you get IP and all this stuff. And then finally, if you're lucky, the trial goes well, bang, you hit it again. This is many years later, it could be 15 years down the line. Okay, maybe a billion bucks. Maybe a billion. <laughs> More, actually. I mean, the average cost to develop a new drug in the United States now approaching $2 billion, if it's not a repurpose and easily put in. So, so this is so CIHR is not going to pay for that, okay? Because the, the budget of CIHR is a billion dollars a year, a <laughs> billion dollars for all research, one point one. So the problem is, where's your money going to come from? And that's where your comment is so apt. 
as you're now you're going from discovery to research, which is often based on a basic, you know, on a some kind of research grant, or it was born of the clinical arena, which was based on a CHR type research grant. But then you've got to start bringing in IP protected so that somebody can think they can make money from it. Then the venture capital starts to get interested or angel investors as they're called and so on. So the money starts to get into the system to be able to create the lucrative environment to go to the next steps. And maybe you're back in the game with this organization like CIHR when you get to trials, like the early phase trials, which aren't that expensive. For a million bucks, you could run one, maybe a lot less. But then, of course, you get into stronger phase trials, you're back into the big money game and so on. So this is all about a tapestry and learning how to run that tapestry, uh, learning the parts, having the colleagues, uh, running the teams, you know, having the teams. That's what it takes to get from there to there with all kinds of different partners. Yep. Um, but I think some of the best affirmation I've had in years. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. It's it's a yep. good perspective, but I would say you probably yep. don't need a billion dollar in your proposal. So I think uh, that's. Really uh, I say yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. But but going back to Christy was saying earlier, I think at your level you really you really want to see that as a team effort. You want to put you in a place that is well way on its way to translation and has a translational. Uh, environment uh, that, that is thinking about it and you rely on that structure so yes you may get a little bit money here a little money right there but you'll, you'll benefit from the structure and you'll benefit from other people's expertise prior findings I think that's a, probably a better way to think about it at, at you level you know and then let's say you know okay you know then you join a group of well established and maybe my capacity to bring more dollars is much higher than your capacity when you're in training, but you know, we I think the team is to recognize that we all work, we at different level, but we work together. So I think put yourself in the environment where you can do the work rather than worrying to get the big dollars, you know, they'll come in time. And then the different trajectory, different way to find money uh, that you figure out along, you know. I mean, I don't think any of us could have predicted the trajectory we had to get money. It's through the people we knew, through the discovery, through the failure, and it's completely unpredictable. Let me ask a question. Some of this uh, speaks a little of, uh, you know, I feel like we're in a bit of a pure zone, you know. But, uh, but part of this pathway is a little impure and it, because it has to do with profit motive. And, you know, uh, I think uh, Mohammed over here might have a few things to say about some of the drugs that have been developed and the pipelines that were developed and how it served uh, people or not. So how do we deal with that? And how do we think about the bigger system? Because it's nice to think about you and you're starting out and you're a little piece and you know, little part. That's all good. But we got a big system out there. And actually the data on what flows through the pipeline and how efficiently is not very, not very good. Actually, it's not very happy. It's not a big happy story, okay? So, you know, I know, Christine, you're having a great time, you're a smart person, it's all good, and you're being successful, and that's all true. But at the systems level, we have a major yeah. issue mm -hmm. yeah. with getting stuff done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. I mean, I think we have to recognize that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, so that's not to say, that's really imploring you to, be, to really think about that, because you're going to change the world. Not us. I will not me, because you know I can see you can see I'm over the hill. You know, even if I was married in utero, you know. Um, so, but you guys are really going to have to help figure this system out to make it better. What are the values that underpin it? You know, in Europe there are public-private partner, partnerships where academia and industry are working together. Um, that's important because. That says we understand we haven't been doing well enough in our own individual parts, and we have to harness the system in a different way. And people can work in both academia and industry with all its complexity and so on. That's one solution that is being you know, thought about and worked on very actively and so on. I think these are important things. Let's not just paint this as, oh, this is so great, this is wonderful. If you work hard, it'll all be terrific. 
Yeah, I'll just make one comment and then we'll go to, I think there's a question here and then maybe we'll take one more question over there. Because uh, I think we're supposed to wrap up in, what, 10, 15 minutes or so? Yeah? Okay, all right. Uh, my only comment was... We'll here all night. <laughs> I, I got to be at work in the morning. Right, okay, all right. We'll get you out in time for that. Um, to Norm's point, I, I mean, I did a short stint in industry and I can tell you there were lots of conversations where um, there's, uh, there are a few products where we thought, wow, that thing transformed the condition. How rare is the condition? It's pretty rare. What's the market like? It's pretty small. What's the cost of production? It's pretty high. Kill the product. It's unfortunate, but that's reality, right? Um, so why don't we go to the next? Uh... Uh, yeah, I had a question for Christine. Uh, it was pertaining to your anecdote about uh, ovarian cancer and how you had said that your commercialization group, you'd realized that they were bad. Uh, <laughs> like, how, or sorry, yeah, or, how were they bad, and like, when did you realize that? Uh, you know what, I was just so naive at the time and so excited to move this forward. Um, and so actually, you know, I was going out and pitching with them, and they, had no deal with me. They had licensed the technology from the institution. They formed a company. I had no equity in the company. Um, and so relative to the deals that have been struck since then, I have a much better sense of what I should have been getting. I had no, so they raised money on me going out and speaking and pitching in, with them, right? They were supporting me as well. Um, but then I had no say on how the money was spent. There was no transparency, no accountability, no insight. And so I don't really know what was happening. Do you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden there was no money. So that's where I would say that as a scientist, if you're lending your name, because you are, right? If you're out there pitching with them as a team, that I recognize that I don't have the expertise maybe in the business development kind of venture and so on space. However, I, I am somebody that's at the table raising, raising money with them, bringing my name, whatever. I'm taking risk with them. So I want some insight and transparency and openness about how they're spending that money. So that was what happened with me there. Um, but you know, it, it was very similar because ovarian cancer is a deadly disease because once, you know, at the time that it's diagnosed, it's usually usually so far along that it's at an advanced stage. Um, and so unfortunately, most women eventually do die of that disease. Um, however, it's a small market. So very quickly, the conversation changed to, well, could we use this in breast cancer? Well, if we use it in breast cancer, we should change from paclitaxel to docetaxel. Can you do that? So then I'm back in the lab trying to change drugs. And so, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily that the team was bad, they were not as um, inspired as I was to move this forward to ovarian cancer patients. And maybe no business partner would be, recognizing all of these business considerations. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think I've grown up a lot since then. That was one of the first things that I really tried to move forward. And since then, I've gotten a lot better at negotiating deals and um, you know, ensuring that there's something, that, that I will have some window into exactly what's going on if my name is being you know, associated with it. Um, but beyond that, it's true. There are business considerations. And, you know, I'm dealing with a few of those things right now. Even if something looks absolutely fantastic, sometimes actually companies have said to me, you know what, I hope this is okay to say here, but you know what, we're not even planning to pursue this in Canada. I'm like, what? What do you mean we're not planning to? I I'm Canadian. <laughs> you know, it's as if they forgot. Um, no, it's too small a market. So forget about Health Canada. We're going to the FDA. We're doing the trials in the US and or elsewhere. And we're going to go to the U.S. And I'm like, but I'm in Canada. Like, do you know what I mean? I became interested in this because my grandmother or my father or whatever, and they don't care about the Canadian market because it's so small. It's a hard thing to hear. But that's, you know, so, so I think part of it is they just weren't as dedicated and focused as I was. And I don't know that anybody would have been. Do you know what I mean? And then also just my not so great negotiation skills at the time. Great. Another question here? Um, so I'm interested sort of on, on the flip side of translating clinical insights in translating insights from other fields into clinical settings like sociology of science, behavioral economics, philosophy of science. Um, and I know it's a bit of a broader question, but in your experience, what you see as the benefits and opportunities of that sort of work and the challenges. This is a question about epistemology. What is knowledge? What does it mean to know something, and what counts? If 
fabulous question. Uh, you know, I think that we have to be careful of our own orthodoxies and the walls that we create around the way we think we know things and what is true, you know, what is truth. Now, scientists, we question everything, right? We're supposed, you know, this is the beauty of science, is that nothing's really true. We're just approaching something we know. I mean, until you get your journal article reviews back, when the reviewers have already achieved ultimate knowledge, <laughs> and, uh, and they already know. Yeah, this is the beauty of the system. We love it so much. Um, but I think, um, I think that in this world where we're dealing with complex problems, I, I was going to bring up the problem, but this is perfect for, I think, your, your comment. Heterogeneity. If I was going to say, you know, if this period I'm in is dominated by any single word for me, it's heterogeneity. It's the beauty of understanding our differences and our sameness, which we can do now in many ways, biologically, psychologically, sociologically, understanding what that, all that different kinds of knowledge means to our existence and harnessing that for better life. You know, knowledge about your postal code actually is one of the most important determinants of understanding how healthy you're going to be versus, you know, whether the promoter on the 14th gene has, a, you know, an A, T, C, or G. You know, just in terms of impact or whether you're impoverished or, you, you know, the context of your family and so on. So I think that uh, really good teams that are translational now are opening themselves up in a very strong interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary, like trans, we talk about transdisciplinary means integrating different kinds of knowledge to create new ideas that are the product of two things, but now become something rather different. So this is a, you know, there are people who are really expert in this epistemology, and I think it's very important. It's great that you brought it up. Very Great pretty. question. That's a beautiful answer. Well, thank you very much. I, w I would love to get that video. <laughs> because that's what this portfolio yeah. at the University of Toronto is about. Story it's really about bringing together interdisciplinary groups and seeing things from very different angles and just creating something that's much greater than the sum of its parts. That's great. All right. Another question. Um, yeah. Norm, Christine, I think that was like a very good segue into what I was going to ask. Um, so you guys bring up, you know, building a diverse team um, a couple times now. And, but I would argue that going back into, you know, being a scientist, I, I actually think the longer you stay a scientist, the more you kind of leave everyone who's not in your, in your field of expertise kind of behind um, because you're so far into kind of like that one single aspect of science and you kind of leave a lot of the translational skills. Um, Christine, you mentioned behind um, because of that. And, um, you know, I, I'm asking um, what, kind of, what kind of things we could start to do in grad school or even before that um, to start building some of that. And um, Christine, you have a lot of resources at your disposal right now, um, I would think, to putting together, you know, beautiful teams um, that are like great at doing a lot of stuff. But for a lot of other people in this room, I don't think that's kind of at our disposal. So what can we do to build smaller teams, maybe um, younger you know, team members um, that have the same kind of diversity in terms of skill and start doing um, what you said uh, on a smaller scale? So, uh, so I agree with you. Um, so this portfolio is also about that. So even new PIs, any PIs can reach out and that's what we're doing. I call it, it's almost like a matchmaking service. We are trying to bring teams of people together that are diverse, interdisciplinary. But you do have these resources at your disposal. It's not easy. I did this also when I started at U of T. Cold calls, emailing, going to networking events, coming to this today, meeting people, getting cards, following up, having coffee. Nobody's going to say no to a coffee. Um, or a tea, I don't drink coffee, but, um, so tea. Um, but, but you just have to do it. You've got to get out there because that, that was a mistake I made at the beginning, like I told you. And as soon as I started getting out there, my best papers, my highest impact papers, not about impact factor, but impact, going somewhere, translation, all of them involve collaboration. 
with other senior people from very different fields. Um, there's one, he's now moved to MD Anderson, David Jaffrey. I worked with him for 20 years. We still work together. We have a company together. But I think we've got, I don't know how many papers, 30, 35 papers together. My best papers are with David. You know, some of them are with, and, and he was a radiation physicist, and I was a polymer chemist. And we just started working together. We, we didn't even understand each other's language, but we just started working together. Do you know what I mean? And, and that was just him sending me an email one day. Um, and I replied to the email. So I do, you've got to get yourself out there. I think it's really important. And I agree with you that, you know, if you're a polymer chemist, you go to the polymer chemistry conferences, you go to the polymer this, you go to this, you know, and it is, you're right. It's very easy to stay in your bubble and be very successful in that bubble. But I think where the really exciting, impactful stuff happens is outside the bubble or at the interface. You know, so I encourage you to get out there. There's also things like Science to Business. I don't know if you've heard of that network. Great network for young people. I've spoken at it, but I'm the oldest person there. Very, very great network um, that's in Toronto and elsewhere. Young professionals, graduate students, and so on. Lots of great networking opportunities. Patience. Yeah, yeah but it's... Um to go back to what we were discussing earlier, an impact factor, you know, whether we want it or not, the system is still built like that, that the, it rewards very deep, narrow expertise. Uh, so it's an active effort that you have to do to develop this collaboration because you've seen, you, you'll see that during that time, you know, and it is very true, you know, that inverted U shape you have in terms of impact of what you publish in the translational trajectory, uh, your colleague actually, and, and uh, you know, the, the es you esteem in your colleague's eye will drop when you're in that curve. Yeah. And, and it's true. Yeah. I mean, I could go to meeting and have colleagues, you know, they publish in Nature, Science, you know, and I, I mean, we publish there also, you know, whatever. But, but in that narrow, it's like we publish in low impact factor, stuff that just needs to go out. You just, it's important, but it's not, you know, earth shattering. And uh, you'll feel the repercussion from, from the fear because the still, the, the, you know, in talking about, talking about the difficulties, the system is still built to reward that ultra expertise. So it's an active effort. I would say it takes a type of people that it takes, you know, that uh, maybe care less about that personal reward, you know, but see the ultimate goal that drives you through. Uh, I think that's very important, you know, it, it's an active effort to develop translational group and now it's much easier you know because you can contact people you don't have you know you can contact anybody pretty much anytime you know within half a day you know where it used to be you had to go to a meeting you had to talk to people you had to get on the phone you get, now it's it's so I have a virtual network of collaborators all around the world some of them have been working for years I never even met them and uh, maybe not <laughs> But I think it's, it's an active effort to develop that. Uh, yeah. Great. I think we've got uh, time for yeah. one more question then. Um, I, but I just want to make one other point just to, to kind of build on uh, Christine and Etienne's comments. Is a lot of people forget your biggest asset, especially when you're starting up, is not money. It's not resources like financial. It's people. And uh, yeah, what, uh, it's not that difficult. People think it's difficult. It's really not that difficult to get really good people to work with you. Number one, if you have an exciting idea that excites other people, and number two, if you're not a jerk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so the rules typically are is excite people and be nice. And I'll build on that. Because as those of you that are still students and trainees, you are in a really amazing and wonderful space because most senior researchers, people in positions of power, they A, need you, and B, they are willing to talk to you as grad students, as trainees, you can approach people and say, I'm wondering about this, can I have 10 minutes of your time? And in most cases, unless they're jerks, they will spend that time and they will introduce you to others in their networks if they like your idea and you approach them well. 
So I disagree with you. First of all, I'm not sure how much resources uh, our VPs actually have no. in theory. Huge. Um, <laughs> there is. I bring in my own Kleenex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. It's a me. true story. <laughs> there is some power and status, but you have a status as a junior researcher or a trainee right now to be able to go and ask and make these collaborative yeah, teams, in yeah. fact, much easier than people who are senior scientists. Yeah. I agree. All right. One more question? No. So on that note, we're going to okay. go into the networking portion of the event uh, to build on what you guys say. On behalf of TRP and everyone here, we do want to thank you for coming and speaking to our students and the audience. <laughs>